Hello and welcome to another episode of Soul Nectar Show, that show where we talk about all things essence, where we gather around the campfire and we share our stories of connection to that which is bigger than us, to the big mystery beyond the veil, those synchronistic moments, those connections. And how we get led into a new understanding of ourselves. And I've actually been listening to uh, the audible lately of the Celestine Prophecies. I can't believe I haven't listened to this yet. And boy, I understand these insights greatly. And the first insight really is all about those synchronicities. That's how we enter the path. So very cool, very cool confirmation. I'm your host, Carrie Hummingbird. And you know, I love to have these conversations every single week. I love to come on here and, and talk to people I know that I meet in my, uh, my own spiritual path who are badasses in their own right and have been walking the actual path, not just talking about it, but actually walking it and doing the hard work on the inside and bring those people to you so that you can really benefit from nuggets of wisdom that they share from their own journey. And of course, I know all of you out there have your own example of this, your own version, and I honor you. I honor you for the path that you walk. And, you know, I feel like coming together and sharing our stories, it helps us to uh, self-validate in a way. Like, it, oh, yeah, I had that happen. And it, maybe it reminds you of something that happened in your own journey that you can then put some emphasis on. So today's guest is a friend of mine, Karen McGregor. Welcome, Karen. Thank you for having me, Carrie. Excited I'm to be here. <laughs> so excited because, of course, Karen McGregor is also one of my speakers in the uh, Return of Mother Wisdom Summit, which is just so exciting, this whole thing that's unfolding for us on the planet right now with Mother Wisdom. But in her own right, Karen McGregor is a thought leader, a global speaker, and catalyst for influencers who have a passion to create positive change in the world. She is the Wall Street Journal bestselling author of The Tao of Influence, Ancient Wisdom for Modern Leaders and Entrepreneurs. Karen supports change makers to be both mystics and activists in their communities, the boardroom and the living room, creating much needed external change while nurturing and growing their internal sacred connection to self and spirit. And Karen is also the founder of Speaker Success Formula, a training company that has supported hundreds of thousands of professionals and entrepreneurs over the past decade to create and deliver powerful messages on stage. And she shared her message on the stage with luminaries like Tony Robbins, who like, of course, I love, uh, Deepak Chopra, John Gray, and, and David Wolf. Her TEDx talk has been viewed by over 1 million people, and her ideas and direct quotes have been featured on CTV News across Canada, Reader's Digest, Breakfast Television, USA Today, Florida Weekly, and many other prominent, prominent media outlets. And so, you know, you can see Karen's pretty much badass. She's been doing her thing. And she's a mom. So, like, come on. That's the biggest badass part at all. You know, she's a mom. So... <laughs> I just like totally pimped you out because you're fantastic. And you know, the thing is, I want to say people like I, I have seen Karen in her shadow, go right into the heart of it with an open heart and just like, yep, we're doing this. And, you know, defense is down and just really, really in it. So um, that's the kind of person I want to share with you guys. So Karen, tell us a little bit about your journey. How did you get to be this badass how do you get to be this part well you know there's two parts to this so just to keep it brief for everybody um the, the i think the most important part i want to share is you know so much of my life was spent in my head and i don't know if anyone else can relate but just trying to figure out life trying to figure out what to do what to say you know how to achieve things in my life uh, primarily through my intellect. And I was identified with that, you know, as long as I had good grades in school, you know, as long as I had um, achievements and awards, then, you know, life was, life was good. And, and I assumed that that was life that I could get by through doing that. <laughs> and my whole world really dramatically shifted when my kids were eight and 10 years old and my husband and I had grown apart over um, the course of three years and decided we would separate. And at that moment, I was so, um, you know, self, self identified with uh, achievement, with, um, you know, just, just the intellectual properties that, that I thought uh, would get me through, um, that I was taken aback by 
my grief, by my shame of, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not good enough as a, as a mom, as a wife, I, you know, I, I've, I've failed my family and all these things that many of us go through in divorce. And I remember Carrie this, I've never told you this story. So it's a, it's a really powerful one though. I remember throwing myself on my bed one day when my kids went to school in the morning and really just sobbing and wailing and saying, I don't want to be here anymore. And uh, my background, just, just, just to be clear, uh, I grew up as a, a Catholic, but I wasn't, a, I wasn't practicing. I hadn't had any connection with, with God, spirit, universe, um, really almost nothing for a very long time. And so I, I heard Mother Mary and I saw Mother Mary. Um, it was shocking to me. And she came to me and she said, Karen, focus on your heart. And uh, which I promptly did. I was so shocked that I, I wasn't going to argue. <laughs> so I, I focused on my heart and immediately it was like an oven had been turned on to the highest degree of heat and this heat just started radiating from my heart and it filled the whole room like intense heat and then I went into what a lot of people call a near-death experience in terms of seeing the white light becoming one with the universe not having a sense of your body and that lasted for quite a long time and when I came back from that uh, to my bed and to my body um, I realized that I had some serious changing to do and that if I could experience that oneness and love by focusing on my heart, what was possible if I let go of all the precepts and the identities and the thoughts that were going on in my head and really just allowed myself to come into my heart. So that was a journey that led me through all sorts of wonderful spiritual uh, deepening wisdom, um, you know, and I became an intuitive. I, I taught people for many years to focus on their heart, um, and uh, and and I loved it. It was it was wonderful. And then my, you know, the voice inside said to me, "You need to teach other uh, other spiritual leaders how to do what you're doing. You need you need to be more." Uh, in that realm and I was happy doing what I was doing so I resisted it for a long time and then finally after three you know I had three people who I had lined up to help my people to you know really start a, a business around their spiritual gifts which they wanted to do um, and three three people in a row had said they were going to support my group and then and then they didn't for whatever reason, you know, and, um, and so my, you know, the spiritual voice was knocking and saying, hang on here. We told you you're supposed to do this. <laughs> yeah, and it's always so, that test, right? It's like, are you sure? Because everyone just bailed. <laughs> exactly, right? And so it was a big, it, you know, a big, it wasn't a big risk, but it was a big risk, you know, like, every time you step into something brand new, it feels like it's a big risk, even if really it isn't. So I did. And uh, from that moment on for 10 years up to, up to now, um, I've, I've had a beautiful company helping people to create their messages and really get, get it out into the world and build their business through, through their message. And, um, so, so that's speaker success formula, um, and getting back to following your heart, listening to your intuition, uh, three years ago, I was guided to go to a CC. So it was almost like I'm coming full circle. So full circle back into really paying attention. What does my soul really want of me? Where am I really supposed to go? And so once again, amongst all the speaker success formula, you know, the, what I'm doing with people, helping people, I was guided to write a book, which had nothing to do with my 10 years <laughs> helping people and all the success they've achieved and, and all of that, nothing. 
And I thought to myself, good God, lady, <laughs> lady as in me, good God, lady, you know, are you really going to put all this effort into a book that has nothing to do with your business? <laughs> yeah, because normally we're told to do a book that supports our business model. Like that's normally yeah. what we're told to do. Exactly. And so um, it just shows me though, you know, like I, I have a, actually, I have my book here, it's Tao of Influence and and how popular it's been and how many people love it. It just shows me that, you know, we, we have different beautiful facets to us and, and trying to understand ourselves from an intellectual point of view, um, I think limits us. Mm -hmm. So I was so happy in the end that I followed my intuition, that I went to Assisi, I, 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 you know, I wrote most of my book there over the course of, three years, I, I took three different trips there and, and, and just feel so fulfilled because this message, although it's completely different, is necessary, is needed out in the world. And so, um, yeah, that brings me to the present moment, which is really that through COVID, through the, you know, through this, this pandemic, whatever you want to call it, many people have different views of it but my view is that you know regardless of of what is happening on in the external world um, we still need to pay attention to what's happening internally on a soul level what is happening to each of us because there's so much movement and so so much is happening but very few of us are really taking a look at that because this is what we're doing we're pointing to the outside and saying i don't like that i wish that would change i find that person irritating which is all fine uh but if if it's at the expense of what's really going on in the soul i think we're losing out Gosh, that's so powerful. I, you know, one of the things I've been thinking about lately and in myself and in investigating talk about inner exploration, and you touched on it when you shared your story about kind of going on your bed and saying, gosh, I just don't want to be here anymore, is that, you know, I've been studying my gene keys and gene key 18 is my purpose gene key. And that has to do with um, moving from judgment and victim mentality into uh, integrity which to me means really like listening to the message as it actually needs to be and bringing yourself there through the gritty process of getting past your judgment and victim mentality. And then, and it's all about perfection. It's all about refinement and perfection, you know, infinite perfection, infinitely perfecting because that we're infinitely refining through this process of integrity. So it's like that victim mentality, even as I've just come back from Peru, it is just, Ooh, it's there. It's present. You know, it's the contraction. It's like, oh no, all these people need this from me. All these people want this from me and I'm feeling burdened. And well, all of that is victim mentality. You know, it's like, okay, because I have total choice in how I show up and how I show up with the demands that are placed on me by other people. I have choice in how I show up for myself. Thank you. Yeah. And that's something that I really went deeply into as well in the Tao of Influence in my book is, you know, what is true freedom? What, what, what is, uh, you know, what does it consist of? Because everybody says, oh, I, I want uh, financial freedom. But, um, you know, there's many people who are financially free who actually have no idea what freedom is. They've never experienced it. And so that, that's been another um, thing that's really come to the forefront for me is to uh, speak to what is real freedom. And I think when I um, started uh, learning more about the Tao, that's why my book is called The Tao of Influence, and really understanding the concepts of the Tao, um, when we go deeply into them, there there is a, the result, the end result is freedom. And so um, one of the things that I talk about that I'd love to share with the listeners is really um, how we develop certain power patterns in order to survive, in order to, you know, uh, be uh, what we think we need to be. <laughs> and so yeah. when, 
you know, when we're very young, we just, we want our needs met. Of course we do. And so, but the thing is, we eventually, during that time when we try to get our needs met, at some point, and it's usually very early on in our childhood, we realize, oh, that needs not being met by that person that I thought would meet my needs. And so then we think, because we're smart, how do we get our needs met by that person? And so we try something else because the first thing wasn't working. And then if that thing doesn't work, then we try something else. And we keep trying till we hit on the thing that works. And when that thing works, it often isn't a healthy way to get our needs met. Mm. But if it works, then we continue to do it. And that develops into the pattern, which can last decades if we're not consciously aware. So for me, my pattern was around control. So a lot of people with the controller inside of them, you know, I'm going to control my environment. I'm going to control my destiny and I'm going to do it all on my, myself, right? Nobody's going to help me. I'm just going to do it all myself. Well, that was because the environment that I grew up in, I didn't feel like I had a sense of control. It felt like it was out of control. It felt like it wasn't in my hands at all. So my, my personal need for safety and, you know, to um, be really heard at the deepest level of who I was, wasn't being met. So we can see that that's just one example mm -hmm. of how we, we become that person. And uh, the first time I was confronted with that, Carrie, was a beautiful, um, you know, I didn't think he was a beautiful person at the time when he said it, but it was a professor that said, why do you always need to be right, Karen? Yep, that's a big one. A right? lot of people have this pattern. Why do you always need to be right? And I, I, was, I was offended by that. And I thought, how dare you say that publicly and shame me and, and all of this. And then and then over the years, of course, that, that was in my early 30s, but over the years, I realized, wow, he is bang on there. There's a part of me that wants to control everything, and part of controlling means I can't be wrong, because if I'm wrong, that means something, uh, I'm, not, I'm not worthy, or I'm not enough if I'm, if I'm not right, quote, right. Yeah. Yeah. This has to do with perfection to you. It has to do with that wanting to be perfect to get attention, negative pole of perfection versus the positive pole where you just sort of realize that everything already is perfect and we are perfecting because we're learning through the lessons that we get here in earth school. Yeah. So it's like, how do you let go of the controller? I mean, I know you're practiced at it now, but like for me, I have had that pattern too because I had an out of control environment. And so to me, it feels like when I notice that happening, like, like, like I told you before I got on the call, I have a lot of people wanting things for me right now. And it's, you know, and I can feel myself like, like kind of pump up my wall or something and, and, and defend. And then I just have to go, ah, okay. <laughs> I just have to let it fall. Like, I don't have any control over it. I just have to let it fall on the inside and go, well, Universe, help me know what to do. Because right now in my moment of my fear matrix, I have no idea what to do. And I love that you mentioned the fear matrix. So um, in my book, I really talk a lot about the uh, practice of letting go that starts really with the initial thought. So as an example, if you are, uh, you know, writing an email, or, sorry, reading your emails and you get an email that for whatever reason triggers this stress, as an example with Carrie, you know, oh, I got another oh, thing. Somebody another wants something thing. else for me and it's urgent. Yeah. <gasps> right. <gasps> Crap. Yes. yes. And so uh, you breathe it in and you actually are aware of that, that initial thought, oh my God, just another thing on my plate. And you, you, you distance that thought from your physical body so you actually see it on the outside you distance it 
and you recognize it because you've distanced it, you recognize it as your old pattern. In my case, need to be right is all about control, right? Controlling my environment. Um, so distancing it from yourself, seeing it for what it is, and then taking a deep breath and allowing that thought, you can even visualize it in a certain symbol, whatever you want, but just floating down the river of, of, of the river of thought, which, you know, I would suggest, I don't know for sure, but I think that at least 98% of our thoughts are actually not supportive of moving forward, of, you know, being that person that we, we want to be. And so because we're so entrenched and trained to have thoughts like this because they come from our past, we, we really need to be equally trained in the opposite, mm -hmm. which is to catch the thought in its, in its inception. Because, it's, because if you don't, your whole body's flooded with all of these you know, hormones and, 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 and not, not stress. Helpful, right. The stress that comes through the body. And one of my, um, nutritional nutritionists, who's a, a former client of mine, she said that, you know, stress is the equivalent of, you know, one, one, even one moment, like a few minutes of stress is the equivalent of eating poorly for a month. So, People say, you know, like I do, I, I always say to people, try to eat healthy, clean, organic, which I will always continue to preach. Um, but the reality is, if you are doing that, but you have stress, you're canceling out all the positive impact of your food choices. <laughs> So it is very interesting, isn't it? So we, so the answer to me is really creating the distancing of ourselves from our thoughts, and in that moment, stopping before the stress takes completely, you know, your body. To me, that is in alignment with this sort of idea that I have that we're a soul that comes into this incarnation and like we slip into this thumbprint suit, you know, because it's a totally unique creation with its own thought patterns and ancestral history and DNA and everything. And we slip into it and it's like our puzzle to solve. But along the way, we forget that we're not the puzzle. We, we think that we, that we start identifying as, oh, I am this puzzle. And that's where it gets sticky because then it's really hard to just take that thought and just put it out here because it's part of your identity. Exactly. But this actually helps you go, oh, wait a second. I am not the puzzle. I am the puzzle solver. That is not. That's just part of this puzzle. And so I get to solve that puzzle for myself. Well, and I, I talk about eight different power patterns that uh, we all have. Some of us have one or two to an extreme and others of us have a few of them lightly. We can see it in ourselves. Um, but what I did recently, which is kind of fun, is to take those power patterns. Uh, so the power patterns are in my book, The Tao of Influence, but I, I ended up taking the eight and looking at them and creating four archetypes of, of basically to, to help us easily, just like you said, carry easily identify. Okay, so this is where I'm headed with this. And so my family and other people, friends of mine, um, who've watched my work around the archetypes, it's actually a real, it's actually very effective and very fun to use. So I'll just tell everybody the, the four types and you can learn more about it on my website, karenmcgregor.com. But the four types are, you know, the, the boar, who the wild boar, so a wild pig. Um, so the boar archetype is very intense on often on goals, uh, you know, very focused, very diligent, follow through, all of that. So, th so that can be a very good thing. The shadow side of the archetype is that they tend to be the controller. We talked about that, right? Controlling their environment and often becoming a bit too uh, aggressive for some people. 
So they might have a louder voice and try and dominate a little bit. And another archetype would go, whoa, that's too much for me. I, I don't respond to that. And they often um, don't have a hard time accessing their heart in that moment because I think it's, yes. mind, it's mind and will driven. Precisely, yes. And so for me growing up, I always assumed that my mind was the answer, as I had said. So that archetype was what I identify with even to this day, because people say, well, you don't seem like a bore. But I say to them, when I am stressed, when I am completely stressed, the first thing that comes to my thoughts are those, are those controlling thoughts mm -hmm. need to be right. How am I going to control this environment? And so it's really important that we all see ourselves in that. And uh, so another um, archetype, so I'll mention the four, uh, the second one is the butterfly. So the butterfly is very different from the boar in that, you know, people generally do tend to flock to the butterfly because the butterfly is present, often deeply spiritual, often charismatic in a gentle way. Like, like people just, you know, they walk into a room and People are already thinking, wow, who's that, you know, and just very attracted to their presence and their energy. Um, the downside of a butterfly is that much like a real butterfly in life, they land and then they're off again. They land and they're off. So they don't actually often in the shadow side of a butterfly anchor into something and really go deep with it. They often have trouble with commitment. Again, stemming back to their, you know, when, when they grew up and, and something perhaps very sudden and dramatic and hurtful happened that they were not expecting whatsoever. And because of that, psychologically, they won't commit to a relationship or they won't commit to their business. Um, uh, bright, shiny object syndrome is quite, you know, quite common with butterflies. A lot so of healers can, fall into that because they... Yes, yes. Yeah, because they all like to all stay on the light side and, and not explore any shadow. <laughs> yes, precisely. And That's then right. we've got the armadillos who are, uh, and, um, you know, you can do, you can be more of, uh, you can have two, a mix of two. So, so don't worry if you find yourself, you know, oh, I'm a little bit of some of these. So an armadillo is very sensitive person and typically extremely bright. So they're, They've got that sensitivity, but they're also extremely bright. And so what happens for them often, because again, because of their childhood, is that they observe the environment, they quickly make an assessment, which is often very accurate. So they can be extremely uh, insightful people and sum something up in a, in a minute. They know exactly what's going on. But because of their past, they choose to withdraw from that environment instead of engaging in it. So these people can often be the people who, you know, write incredible books, but then, you know, if you ask them to be in public or you ask them to be part of a movement or, you know, engage in some community initiative, they often will back away. And you'll see this, that they're, they're the typical classical observer of life, very insightful, but the shadow side is when they need to be there amongst the people, they often aren't. They, they will be more like a, her, like a hermit. And, and so that withdrawal syndrome, you know, some people say, well, I'm just shy. That's just who I am. And in my book, I really call, call people out on that because it's very easy to say, well, I'm Italian, you know, of course, I'm going to be this, this or this, or I'm, you know, for me, I always joke, I'm German, you know, I'm very, mm, whatever, you know, boorish. <laughs> and, and, and so um, it's easy, though, for us to do that, because we think it comes from a genetic or historical predisposition. But really, a big part of it, the much bigger part of it, is looking at our, you know, our, our old wounds and how they inform um, our current patterns of behavior. Yeah. yeah, that's true. So is that four 
or was there? No, nope, we got another okay, one. Okay, there's one more. I was counting. I yeah, was like, wait a second. One, the last one people laugh at. My one of my children is is this last one. So we always laugh when when he. I'll give you the example when he gives the behavior of. Of this particular one, so this is the last one is a bird. It's a it's called a cockatoo, and cockatoos are birds that need affection and relationship in order to survive. Mm -hmm. And it's true that if you purchase a cockatoo tomorrow and you give it food and water, but you leave it alone, you come back two weeks later, that bird's going to be dead. And uh, many people have found this and they're very distraught because they think, well, I fed the bird, I gave it everything it needed. No, actually you didn't. You know, this bird needs um, people. It needs uh, relationships. It, it, it needs to connect with someone or something else. So the cockatoo is amazing because they are the relationship people. They're the people that bring everyone together. They know everybody. For instance, uh, Carrie and I belong to the same community, Evolutionary Business Council. You can see the people who bring people together. They know everybody. They invite people into the community. That's just who they are. And that's a gift. The shadow side of the cockatoo is that they take things too personally. So if one person says something or does something and it's not in alignment with what they, the cockatoo thought, they should be, do, or act, then the cockatoo takes it personally. So um, it can, if left unchecked, it can lead to feelings of victimhood, um, feelings of, uh, you know, almost like a martyr sometimes. Oh God, I do so much for everybody, but they're, you know, they're not stepping up to the plate, that kind of thing. So the, my son is a cockatoo, the younger one, and um, and both the bright side and the not so bright. Yeah, side. Well, you get to take the whole package. <laughs> yeah, and so the, he's he's a good sport though because when he starts saying, "Oh, mom, this, this, and this," you know about life, and it's the same story I've heard twenty times. I say to him, oh, that's nice, my cockatoo. I'm glad you're sharing that. <laughs> and he laughs because he actually sees his own story being played out through his words. So it's a way for all of us, I think, once we understand each other in a fun way, we can actually, you know, gently remind each other, okay, what am I thinking? Is this being supportive of my current reality and moving forward with my life? Oh my gosh, Karen, I can see myself in almost all of those archetypes at one moment or another, but <laughs> yeah. I definitely am a cockatoo for sure. Yes. Like, that's my major thing is because I love people and I love connecting and I love bringing people together. And uh, because I do that, people, I think, lean on me a little bit for that. And then they're like, hey, we want you to do this. And I'm like, oh, you know, like I need time for me. So I've had to learn how to like build time into my schedule for myself and not feel like that's selfish. Like I like, no, I need some time to ground deep and to feel nourished and to feel nurtured and to build my reserves back up so I can go do the cockatoo thing again, you know, because I need, yes. I need love. And I, I have a husband who's also a cockatoo. <laughs> so so it's like it's like that. who needs the validation today you know probably both yes. of us <laughs> well and I love that you you know and this is the whole thing about our shadow is if we can be proactive to give ourselves what we truly need then that whole shadow side doesn't even need to be there because we've filled our cup we've done what we need to do to take care of ourselves um, and quite often with cockatoos, they're the ones that are least likely to take care of themselves because they do want to care for other people. Yeah, that's true. And it's good to have good boundaries around that. It's something I've had to realize because I'm, I'm like so um, sensitive and I can feel everything. And because I'm so looking out all the time, like I'm constantly feeling and perceiving what's going on around me. I just naturally built that way to feel and perceive. And plus some of it's my wounding as well, but, but I, I'm geared, I have a very strong muscle there. And so when people don't feel things, it always surprised me for a long time to, to know that people were not even tuned into that at all. Like that was just not part of their reality. And they were just 
they're all like like you were saying the, the first one the boar it's like sometimes i feel like people in that space if you're in your mind then and you're not in your heart then you really don't have any idea what's like the effect on other people but as a cockatoo i'm like well you know that that's not that that's affecting people you can feel it and they're like no it can't so <laughs> Yeah. I'd be like upset with them for being unfeeling and, and everything like that. And they're like, well, but I'm just doing me. And it's like, oh, so it's like this, you know, we, so it's great. I love these, I love these ideas. Cause of course the board doesn't know that like charging down is going to scare everything in its bath. You know, it's just doing its thing. Yes. And you know, just this uh, awareness in a fun way can be really helpful for family dynamics, for boardroom dynamics. And so that, you know, and, and getting back to the, the, the whole reason I wrote this book is not just for self-awareness, but also if we are to influence, I mean, the word, the word influence is in the title. It, um, I, I always say influence should come from love, you know, and not from fear. Mm. And, and if we're not aware, if we're not aware of our own actions and why we do what we do and think what we think, it's so difficult to be of influence. So people say to me, well, what do you think influence is? And for me, the deepest part of influence comes from being completely ourselves with, with, with no fear filters in front of us. So we all come to this earth as beautiful, uh, unique beings. But we often know the difference, what, like if two people walked into the room and one was completely present, no fear, just really being themselves, whatever their personality, that person we know is someone really unique and very, and we want to get to know them, don't we? Mm -hmm. But if Thank someone you. walks in and they're like, they're famous, maybe, but they've got uh, airs of, you know, whatever it is of um, superiority, let's say, as an example. Probably not, but maybe some people do. So let's just say that the air is superiority, but very famous. There's going to be a certain group of people that will still be attracted to them. However, the people who are completely present are going to sense and feel, huh, protection here what is that person protecting why is that person protecting themselves by the air of superiority do they need to feel better than do they need that they're not feeling good enough so they need to have that air of superiority so it really helps us to understand you know the goal is to be influ influence to be influenced not to want to be influential mm -hmm. does that make sense yeah, it's a being state. I and I think we do have to ask ourselves why it is we want the influence. I feel like sometimes um in my own path this has been a big contemplation for me because the work I do is spiritual with people, which is very sacred. And because I'm aware of my own egoic constructs and become aware of more ways it plays out all the time. And because I want to be a beneficial impact with other people, I don't want to be like leading them down the primrose path, you know? Yes. And so I, I really, I'm very mindful about my influence. And so whenever I'm making a decision or like um, setting a course for something, I'm really mindful of the energy with which I'm doing it and the, the intention of it so that it's attracting the right vibration and it's actually setting the right context. It's a lot of mindfulness. I mean... Like, uh, I used to be very, um, I used to be disconnected from that a little bit more like a bore. And I used to be like, well, I'm just going to do this because I'm a manifester and I don't need anybody and I can just do it. But that has its own energetic. And it, it kind of feels like forcing people into my worldview. And with this, it feels more like to be, con to be conscious with your influences, to realize that um, I want to help other people make beneficial decisions for themselves and I want to open the door for that but then I want to step back and get out of the way and and that's that's the biggest key about Taoism too is that we are in balance and and flow with that energy so that you know we're not pushing and we're not backing away yeah 
So as soon as we push, we're doing it out of fear, like, oh, I better help these people because if I don't help them, then I've done something wrong. Or if they don't change, I've done something wrong. So it's almost like a fear that people won't be impacted or won't be influenced. So that's, we definitely don't want I've that. I've had that fear along my way. Like I've had that sense of urgency during times of my development and I have done that and it hasn't worked out very well. <laughs> so yeah. and, it's not and the right energy. I, yeah, you and I are both very similar. I've had that so many times and I, I have to stop and just check in with myself. What's going, what is really going on here? So the opposite is also true where you know, just like I talked about the armadillo, where we slowly are backing away from, oh, okay, I, you know, it's, it's, it's not my role to step in and say something, or, you know, I, I'm not going to take part in anything that's happening in the world. I'm just going to like back away. Uh, you know, I'm just one of many voices. Nobody's going to listen anyway anything like that, you know, when we start to back away, then we abdicate our personal, really our personal influence on the world. And that's sad too. So I think that being in the middle in and having that balance is the best way to go. Yeah. And I've heard my, some of my mentors have called that being a stand, being a stand for someone to claim their transformation. So I practice that now. I practice just being a stand. I'm not moving forward and I'm not stepping back. I'm just a stand for that person who called me or whatever. And we had a conversation and they want this for themselves. I'm a stand for that and they have to do it. So you can't do it for people. It doesn't work. They have to do it for themselves. And, and that's true leadership too. I think when people, you know, ask me about leadership, it isn't about trying to lead somewhere, someone somewhere, <laughs> right? It's, be, it's being who we really are without the fear, without trying to pull people over there uh, because the, it, that will never work as we know. No, it's like a trajectory. Now I see it like even on this retreat I just did, what it, the way it presented itself to me is that these people are on a transformation path. They're already on the path. And all I'm doing is seeing where they are on the path. And I can see, oh, probably sensing up ahead a little bit here is a breakthrough. Awesome. I'm going to be ready for that. So I'm, I'm sensing and I'm ready for if and when it happens because I can feel the energy of it building. So it's like, okay, that's about to pop. So it's like, it's cool because I'm not, I'm not leading them there. They are just, they're leading themselves there. Spirit's guiding them there. And I'm just aware I can just see, cause I know the energy and the way it feels when it's about to pop. So I'm like, I'm ready to be there for them when it pops. So it's kind of fun that way to have that higher view, but in order to get there, you got to do the inner work. So that's to me an encouragement for everybody out there you know, as you do your inner work, Karen's book is awesome. I mean, I've read this book. It has so, it's so clear, the egoic um, constructs that you point out that we all share and making yourself aware of them is actually gives you power because you're able to see them more clearly and nip it in the bud and redirect, right? In a more conscious way. And then once you clear out your own stuff, you can serve for other people, which is so cool to sit back and watch the whole thing happen. So it's very yes, cool. Yes, it really is. And, and I think that, you know, later in my book, I do talk about when we do reach that state, what's possible for all of us, you know, working in community together as co-leaders in a, in a world that quite frankly, really needs our support right now. So I think yeah. the, you know, I think that's why I was guided to, buy, to, to, to write the book is because it is timely right now. I didn't know what was going to happen three years, you know, before all of this started, but now I realize, okay, that's why I was guided to write the book. It's coming out at a time when it's desperately needed. So I encourage all of you listening out there today you know, really take some time to see, are you listening to that still voice or that those images that are presenting themselves to you? Um, are you seeing the synchronicities as Carrie said, because it is so important and we would not 
get that guidance if 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 we were meant to ignore it you know so uh, just trust sometimes it's a big leap of faith like myself why would I invest three years of my time writing a book and that was it, it, it only has come to pass now why I needed to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's a really handy reference and I'm super delighted that it was uh, on the charts at the Wall Street Journal because that yeah. just, to me, that means mainstream people noticed it. It's like, oh, mainstream people are going to read this. And yes. I have a thing about that. Like I want more people on the spiritual path and I think a lot of mainstream is ready to open to that. So it was great. Yeah to see that that showed up on, on, the, on a mainstream list. So congratulations. I do have a lot of hope and, and, uh, and pos positivity around the mainstream really becoming more interested in ancient wisdom. And Carrie, I know that's something that you really have worked hard at too, is to see where our ancient wisdom can meet with our modern day practices um, to really benefit the world. Yeah, it's time for us to look backwards to our ancestors and, and harness all that wisdom and bring it forward today because we, we got a little lost in our technology drive and our, our security and our comfort drive. And we need to give back a little bit more to our integration with the earth and, and how we can be in service to all of life on earth, not just humanity, but the bigger picture. So, oh my gosh, thank you so much. So KarenMcGregor.com for resources with you and finding out more about your book. The Tao of Influence, you can check it out on Amazon and uh, Wall Street Journal is on that list. So thank you so much for lending your wisdom and thank you for being part of uh, also the Return of Mother Wisdom Summit. I appreciate you, sister. I appreciate you too, Carrie, and, and also everyone out who is listening out there today. Thank you and I look forward to connecting soon. Awesome. Okay, well on Soul Nectar Show, we give everybody kisses on the way out, but before I give you kisses... Everybody, I'm asking you, please give this a good like and a review on, on iTunes or YouTube or wherever you saw it. Share it out, please. Get this message out there far and wide. This book is actually really awesome, and I think people would benefit from it. So, you know, share it out. Like, once again, not a leaning forward and, hey, you need to read this, but more like, here's a really cool book. I thought you might want to check it out. That's an open-handed invitation. So please do that for us. I appreciate you. And now, okay, here's your kisses because I know you're going to do it. I appreciate you. Here you kisses. Here's your little bribe. <laughs> Here we go. Love you guys so much. You can join me if you want, Karen. I'm going to give kisses. <laughs> I love you guys. I'll see you next time on Soul Nectar Show. Bye for now. <laughs>